Hi everyone, my name is Andrew Seaman. I am the LinkedIn news editor for Job Seekers and Get Hired, which is a weekly newsletter and these broadcasts that we have every Friday to discuss job searching during this difficult time. I wanna thank you as always for joining us and I wanna start this conversation as I always do and welcome all of you job seekers. And I want to invite you to introduce yourselves in the comments. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your job search. And I also want to encourage you to actually network with each other in the comments. I've heard some great stories about people who've met each other and have helped each other with their job searches during this difficult time. So maybe you'll see someone who lives in your area, maybe you'll see someone who works in your industry or wants to work in your industry, and be sure to reach out and just see if there's some way you might be able to help each other. Before we jump into your questions, which I hope you'll add to the stream, I first wanna talk a little bit about what has been going on in the United States over this past week. Um, you know, As someone who's been in New York, I don't think I've had a discussion where the death of George Floyd or the resulting protest has not come up in the discussion. Uh, and obviously I think a lot of people, especially in the US have been deeply affected by this, especially job seekers who are already under a lot of strain. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how this might affect job seekers and job search. Uh, so what I want you to do is be part of the discussion, please be respectful in the comments. And even if you are feel this conversation may not be for you, what you need to remember is that racism and systemic racism is not uh, the job of people of color to fix. Uh, if it was, it wouldn't necessarily be a problem because they would be able to fix it. So it's really on all of us to make sure that we're reforming systems and doing a better job of helping people um, have all the opportunities that everyone else has. So I want to introduce our guest today, who is Jennifer Tardy. Uh, she is a expert when it comes to working with job seekers and hiring experts. Uh, Jen, welcome to the broadcast. Hey, Andrew, thank you for inviting me to talk about such an important topic. Definitely. And, you know, thank you for being um, open to talk about this because it's obviously sometimes a difficult conversation to have. And I think that's what a lot of job seekers are struggling with. And um, I guess, can we start off by, you know, telling us a little bit about yourself because you work with job seekers, you work with recruiters who are on the other side. So you have that sort of very full spectrum of view, but at the yeah. same time, you specialize in diversity and inclusion issues. So can you tell us a little bit about why you wanted to focus on that? Yeah, and what a what a great time to to be in this world of of what I do. So um, I always tell people that I do two things. One is I'm a career coach. I help job seekers to navigate the hiring process to find a good job. But then on the other end, I also train recruiters. And so employers come to me who are looking to create um, an an effective diversity recruiting program to um, to really help them to increase diversity. So my goal is to stay on both sides and to help them to meet more easily. And it's one of the reasons why I left corporate America so that I could come out and I could have these types of conversations to help people to, um, to get better employment. And that's really wonderful. And I know just even from my own experience, um, you know, people need help sometimes addressing these issues within companies. Um, and it's really amazing the the gains that companies can see when they invite this, you know, the type of help that you provide um, in orders. In fact, I think we've talked about that before. Um, and, you know, I was hoping we could start off the discussion by talking about job seekers because uh, mm -hmm. we've, we've discussed where, you know, people who are black or, and African-American, they, you know, carry this burden with them all the time. And I know I've received questions from members who said, you know what, how do I go into a, an interview and not know the person on the other side is going to judge me just for the color of my skin? Yeah. And, you know, especially now with everything's going on, um, you know, the trauma of, you know, George, George Floyd's death af at the hands of police, um, you know, that might be burning a little bit deeper um, and be a little bit more of an effect right now. So for job seekers who are maybe struggling a little bit this week, what should they do? Um, you know, should they take some time off to recollect themselves? How do you think that they should proceed? Yeah, one of the first things that I do want to acknowledge is that odds are job seekers today are feeling exhausted. So if you paint the picture, not only are we in a season of a pandemic, but on top of that, everything that you're seeing on the news is around um, protests related to the death of 
you know, um, George Floyd. And then we were talking about Ahmaud Aubrey plus Breonna Taylor, plus a host of other people. And, and so when people ask me, you know, Jennifer, how are job seekers feeling? I, I think the best word to describe it is exhausted. So it's something that to your point, Andrew, Black people have been carrying this around for so long and the exhaustion comes in from, here we go again, here's yet another example of how, um, of the, the unfair treatment and how it disproportionately affects specific populations. Yes, people of color, but in this instance, we're talking about Black people. And so um, should a job seeker take some time off? I don't know that everyone has that luxury. And, um, and that's another conversation that I've been having. Um, because of what's happening with the um, with the, the pandemic and people have layoffs and on top of that, having um, mouths to feed, you, you know, ourselves included, some people don't have that luxury. And so what I share with people instead is, this is an important time to practice self-care. And when we talk about practicing self-care, you have to ask yourself, what do I need in order to make it through this season? So if I don't have the luxury of taking some time off or taking a day or two away from my job search and I need to continue going, what do I need to make it through? Fortunately, within, um, within the Black community, we have a long history of resilience that's been passed down from our ancestors and we still have that le level of resilience today. So being able to ask yourself, what do I need? Who can help me get what I need? And then using that so that you can continue doing what you need to do to move forward. I think that's great advice. And I think that's one of actually the benefits of having a network and being able to network with people is that you can reach out to them for help. So it's one of those things where you could just say, I need you to listen. I don't even need like things, uh, anything in return other than just a, a sounding board. So I think, you know, that's one of the, the, the great things about networking is that you have these people you could fall back on. Um, and, you know, and I'm so excited to see that we have so much engagement in the stream. Um, we have people, you know, Serena from New York City, Justin from Colorado, Dan from Canada, uh, Javella from the Virgin Islands, and Diane from Pennsylvania. Thank you all for joining us and being part of this conversation. Um, and, you know, conversations, especially with potential employers, are difficult. Like, I think, you know, earlier this year, I think every every job interview that was happening or every communication that was happening touched on the pandemic and the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But I know going throughout my week, pretty much every discussion has touched on the protest and sort of the need for reform, um, you know, to, to make the world a little bit more equitable for everyone. And, you know, when it comes comes to these conversations for for em, with employers how should job seekers navigate them if, if this comes up or you know should it be something that is talked about yeah and if you don't mind let me actually speak to recruiters first because and this is something that i, I share with recruiters um a, an actual interview I, I understand the intent of being able to you know display empathy or to show that you care by bringing up um, within an interview, the topic of what's going on around the protests and Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and so on and so forth. However, an interview was not the place for that um, because uh, um, in an interview, the person sitting before you is trying to ensure that they can display their knowledge, their skills and their abilities. And so if you bring up such a triggering topic, they may not be able to show up as their best self. So even though you may have the best intentions, the outcome of that may not be um, the best for the actual candidate that's before you. And that's not just black candidates, it's all candidates in general. Um, the place for those conversations are, you know, the conversations, what recruiters, not recruiters, but what job seekers are looking for. Um, they wanna know what is, what is your CEO? What are they talking about? What about your senior leadership team? What are they talking about? What are you talking about on social media? So to have those conversations to show support, make sure that your organization is showing support but outside of the interview. Now, if you're a candidate and you happen to be in your interview and the, a conversation comes up or a question comes up, um, I would say to um, at least you know, acknowledge it, say, you know, thank you. I appreciate you uh, for you know, acknowledging your support and then pivot back to the overall interview. So leave it short, leave it sweet, especially if you know that you are also in a heightened state of emotion, but then pivot it back in a very professional way. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've heard a lot of people say is that, especially during this time, if you want to reach out or talk about it, you know, uh, talk about this in general with someone, is that it needs to be a genuine outreach too. So okay. it can't be, you know, just sort of say, hey, you know, I acknowledge this during the interview. Um, it needs to be a genuine concern, um, which mm -hmm. I think is important. And we talked a little bit, um, you know, when we, we had a call the other day about the idea that the protests that are going on now are obviously um, largely focused on overhauling sort of the justice system in the US um, and how it unfairly targets and treats um, people who are Black and African American. Um, but you pointed out that, you know, systemic racism exists in other systems. So when it comes to the hiring process, and I know there's obviously a lot of resources that are dedicated and talked about, um, but how can companies and people who are in a position to do something, do something, what should they be doing? Yeah, so w whenever I'm talking to recruiters and, and we're talking about the diversity, we're talking about diversity recruiting, most of the time when recruiters come to me, they're like, Jennifer, all I need is some additional sources. Just tell me where else can I go to find more women, more people of color, more veterans, so on and so forth. And then I'll always share with them that it's not just about that. It's not just about finding new sources. And it's not just about what you can do. It's also about what you have to stop doing as well, too. And so the, the hiring process can feel like a massive obstacle course, especially if you're, you're different, right, from, from the people that you see at the top, the people who are most successful, the people who have the most influence, which historically have been white men. Right. And so the further you are away from that, it can feel more like a hiring process. Um, it, you don't like hiring. it can feel more like an obstacle course. And so one of the big things that we talk about is with recruiters is how can we remove the bias that's within the that's within the process, creating that obstacle course. So, for instance, and, and I actually break it down by the standard steps in the hiring process. If you just think about the first step in the hiring process, which is submitting an application, an example of what that obstacle course could look like is number one, what if the application, what if the actual position never gets posted? If it doesn't get posted, I can't see that there's a position out there. What if the job description is um, has way too many requirements that are that are not indicative of what it takes to be successful in that position. Now, um, especially if you remember what Sheryl Sandberg was talking about in her book Lean In, many women will not will look to see how many of them they meet, and if they don't meet a lot of them, they may back out of applying to the position. What if it requires a degree or multiple degrees? but it's not really a justification for being able to be successful. That's another obstacle course. What if it's heavily laden with masculine terms in there that may be intimidating for some people? I mean, so I've just named a few things within the first step, which is the application overall. And so that, that can really become an obstacle course. And so I wanna make sure that recruiters um, are, are able, since they're on the front lines, they can begin seeing those things and intervening. But an, another major point too, as we're talking about um, recruiters, is recruiters, if we're talking about increasing diversity within an organization, recruiters have to feel comfortable with diversity, with people who look different and identify differently from them. If I come across a recruiter and they stutter when they're trying to figure out whether to say African-American or Black, and they don't know the difference between race, ethnicity, or even nationality, that's where we have to first start. Recruiters have to feel capable, qualified, and comfortable with matters related to diversity in order to help to increase diversity within the organization. And then once all of that kind of um, works its way out, then it can help job seekers, more people. Like that in and of itself can, can increase diversity for your organization. Definitely. And I think, you know, what research has shown is that the more you focus on this and work on making sure you have a diverse workforce, the healthier your organization is. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be in a place where, um, you know, someone came in who was a person of color and said, I don't see many people here who look like me. And what was incredible being a part of the, that process was how quickly we were able to change things, but also how much better it felt working 
there for everyone because, mm -hmm. you know, your colleagues were more comfortable. Um, you know, you had more voices and you were more confident in your work because those voices could be heard and said, you know, I don't think this is a good idea. Um, so I think, you know, that's an incredibly important thing to, to focus on. And, you know, it's not just something where, you know, it should be focused on, I think every once in a while, that's something that really takes dedication and, and work to, to do all year round. That's right. That's right. And, and to, to that point of, you know, a new person coming into an organization, there's, there's this whole, whenever I'm coaching job seekers, whenever they come to me and I tell people all the time, I don't have to spend so much time on here are the tactics and here are the things that you need to do to show up well. I spend more time helping people to navigate through their own emotions around enoughness. Am I enough for this position? Am I ready for this position? Will they see me in the right way for this position? But all of that, there, it's, it's no coincidence that it happens, especially if when you look at organizations, no one looks like you, whether you're a woman, a person of color, a veteran, or a person who identifies as LGBTQ+, if, if you can't see it, it begins to make you question, you know, can I find my fit here? You know, will they see me as enough? Will I have challenges when I, when I go into the organization? So one of my favorite sayings is diversity begets diversity. Yes. And in fact, I saw in the stream just a few minutes ago, I think someone named Tina, um, if I remember correctly, said that you helped her a, a lot with her career. So <laughs> um, you got a shout out there. And, you know, and I want to <laughs> and I want to encourage everyone to follow you on LinkedIn because you obviously post a lot of great uh, content and you, you talk about this a lot and then also job searching and. Um, you know, thank you for that discussion. And if anyone has any questions, you know, be sure to get them into the stream about what we just talked about and your job search. So um, if you, let's transition over to um, some of the questions that came in. We had a lot come in a little bit earlier. Um, okay. And, you know, we have a question here from Kim uh, from the stream. And this is something I know I've heard from a lot of people. Is it a good time to change fields? Um, I think a lot of people are sort of struggling with the idea of like pivoting to a new industry, but should they be thinking about that now? Yeah. So if, if you, if, if Kim, Kim, if you were my client, the first thing that I'll ask is why, right? So it's not about yes or no to do this, but why are you doing it? If it serves you to shift into a new field because you think that you can have a better career path in this new field, absolutely. So if you're running towards something positive, I'm all for it, but if you're running away from something negative, then we'd have to have a different conversation because odds are you're gonna run into obstacles anywhere you go and I don't want you to keep running. So it's it's good to shift only if it's beneficial and it's serving, uh, it's serving you for your own personal career path. Wonderful. And actually, I just pulled out a um, a question from the stream from Ingrid, um, who's in North Carolina. And how would I know social bias is happening because I am black? Um, I think that's probably a question. I, I've gotten that question before, but, you know, um, how how would a person know that? And as are you won't. So I, I won't spend a lot of time. So if, if I'm you, Ingrid, I think that's what you said your name was. I wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to figure out if it's happening. One of This is one of the benefits of actually working with a career coach. Career coaches have seen so many patterns of things that happen. I, can, um, I was on the phone with a client the other day, and she was sharing with me that she was looked over for a position. And I started throwing out some questions. Okay, so a person, you were in that position in an interim fashion. Okay. And so a person was um, brought in behind you. I bet you didn't know the person was coming in behind you until the announcement came up. Yep. I bet, you know, the person was already connected to the CEO. Yep. I bet da da da. And so I started listing off these things. She was like, Jennifer, how did you know? As a career coach, I've seen patterns of this happen so often. And also having worked in recruiting um, in the past, working with leaders. So it, it's not really, I would more so link up with a career coach to help to navigate the bias then for you to, you have more important things to focus on, like like getting that great job. <laughs> yeah, and it's one of those things that can take sort of that burden off your mind to say, okay, I have someone helping me and guiding me, which is always great. And um, actually, and, and on sort of a similar point related to our discussion, we have a question from Tamara who asked, is in an interview, is it okay to ask about a company's diversity and inclusion policy? Yep, you, you absolutely can. If it's meaningful to you, if you really want to, if you truly want to understand, you know, what 
um, how a company embraces diversity? Maybe that's a better question. But I also want you to ask yourself, what are you trying to gain from that question? Like, what is the thing that you want to know? So, for instance, you know, people may ask generically, what is your policy on diversity? But that doesn't really get get to the answer that they're really trying to figure out. They're trying to figure out, can I bring my whole self to work here? And so you want to make sure that you know yourself, the, the type of answer you're trying to get to so that you can frame your question around that. If your question is, how can, can I bring my whole self to work here without fear of being judged or fear of being overlooked for the next opportunity, then frame your question up around that. But yes, it's completely okay. And pay attention to how comfortable the hiring manager or whoever's interviewing you, how comfortable they are in answering that question too, because that's also indicative around how much um, cultural competence and how much training um, that, that that manager has had and that the organization has invested in that manager. Yes, that fantastic advice. And I know as a journalist, um, you know, who asks questions all day, um, you know, you have to ask a specific question if you want a specific answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you ask a broad one, you're going to get a very broad answer and, you know, give them wiggle room to answer something that they want to instead of what you actually want to know. Um, and then you walk away not really knowing the answer to the question. And you're like, oh, well, I'm going to take this job. And then you get there and you're like, wait a minute, I don't like it here. <laughs> and um, speaking of questions, actually, we have a question here from Ursel who asked, why are interviewers so bent on trick questions? Why won't hiring managers be more straightforward? Um, and I think every once in a while, people get kind of caught off guard by a question that someone will ask. Yeah, so I'm still trying to understand that as well, too. <laughs> so now, so so here's the thing. Um, so it's really important that our hiring managers understand how to interview. And some managers believe that if I put you in a hot seat and if I make you really uncomfortable, I really want to see how you show up there. More seasoned managers, managers who do know how to interview well, they truly understand that if I can make you feel at your most comfortable, then I won't necessarily be interviewing your representative. I'll get a really good sense of who you are as a person because that's the person that's going to show up on the first day of work. So I don't, um, I never really recommend those trick interviews, but I, I am a big fan of um, behavioral interviews where where we can talk a little bit more about how you've handled certain situations in the past because it's more indicative of how you may handle the same situation in the future. The trick interviews, I, I tend to believe that those are less experienced hiring managers, which is okay. It happens. Everyone has to learn. Yes. And um, and actually, and we have this question, and this comes up actually, I think, in, in most um, Get Hired Lives that we have because it's so okay. prevalent. Um, and I think this does fall into sort of the diversity and inclusion um, umbrella is how do you know when you're dealing with ageism and how do you deal with it? And those questions come from Susan and Bruce. Ah, and I'm so glad Susan and Bruce brought that up because another piece of going back to the obstacle course and thinking about the application, when companies are using words such as we want fresh new faces and we want recent college graduates and things like that, it's it it can cause people who are, you know, who are more experienced in their career to say, they're probably not looking or talking to me. And so they're leaning out of the process overall. And so you can't really, hmm, it's, it's one of those things, again, that you don't want to, um, to spend so much energy trying to decipher if this organization is going to, um, you know, to nix me because I'm way too experienced for the position. Where I would focus my effort in more is making sure that the types of roles that you're applying to complement the level of experience that you have. Where I find that most people kind of get caught up in is they um, they may be way overqualified for a position, but they still try to apply to it anyway. And so what I always, I always ask, why? Why not apply to that stretch level position? Why not apply to that next level? Because it's more complementary of your level of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah. And I, I know one thing is that, you know, a lot of people, they always look for the code words too. Like you said, you know, um, oh, you have too much experience or something like that. And um, which I know can really knock people, you know, back a little bit in their job search just from the sort of mental standpoint of being told that. Um, so, yeah. um, you know, it's a really difficult um, topic to sort of overcome. Um, and, you know, something, and, and this I think plays into that too, is a question from Cathay, uh, who wants to know what, how do you um, 
investigate a company's real culture versus what they tell you, um, which I think is a great, great question because they'll always give you the answer that they want you to hear. But how do you actually know what the company culture is like? That's right. So one of the things and I'm, I'm going to answer your question, but one of the things that I always share with um, with recruiters and employers is that a culture of an organization is an ideal that many organizations are trying to reach. But on the road to having that ideal culture, that organization has an environment. There's the organizational environment. There's there's a, an environment within the actual department. There's an environment within the actual you know, within the business unit or the department, and even their managers that create their own environment. So the question that you want to find out, because the place that you're going to spend most of the time is with the manager in that department. So you want to find out, I, I, you know, what is the um, what is that environment like? And so being able to ask those questions again during the interview. So, but you also have to know for yourself, what do you mean by a good environment? What does a good environment mean to you? Does it mean that you're working with a boss who invests in you? Does it mean that they're, you know, that your peers um, are, are open to teamwork? And you ask those questions that way too. But now, even before you go into interview, some people ask me, Jennifer, how can I find out just by looking at the organization? if it's going to be the right cultural fit for me too. And so it's by doing things like checking out Glassdoor. What are other employees saying about the organization? Um, Indeed also has um, some information around how other employees are talking about the organization too. If you can find um, employees, so maybe you know someone that, that knows someone that works in the organization, finding out from people that you trust or people that you know that they trust about what the organization is really like too. And, um, and, and pay attention to what they're talking about and, um, within social media, within their website, too. Like, where are they? When they do things like um, do things for the community, what community? When they're doing things for, um, for their employees that, that are activities, are they activities that, that, that show you that they understand your culture as well, too? So it's, it's a lot of things that you can do um, to do your own research to find out about what the environment is like. But make sure you know what environment you're looking for to begin with. Yeah. And something that I always tell people is to look for pictures uh, that the company posts, you know, look for real pictures, maybe by employees. You know, if they're, like you said, at a community event or something, um, you know, what are they doing? Who are who, who are among the group? Um, and then also just like, you know, I, I think it's great to sort of see the visual sometimes of what a company looks like day to day, um, even just from like how you're, you're going to dress going into the interview and everything. But you can get so much information by just looking at the pictures that they're posting about what they're actually doing. That's um, right. And, and, you know, in, in full transparency, even when I was on my job search years ago, when I would um, when I was making the decision on which companies I wanted to work in, one of the first two things that I would do is First, I would look at the board of directors because you know typically you'll see the pictures of them online, and then also I would look at the senior leadership team, the pictures that they show. And if I and, and if I didn't see anyone who looks like me, whether it was uh, looks like any way that I identify, I knew how difficult it was going to be for me at the organization. I could make an assumption, and I was typically right about how difficult it was going to be. If there were only one or two women in senior leadership or even in um, on the board of directors. I knew it would be difficult for women to have a voice because the women, the one or two women who were in senior leadership, they were trying to find their own voice and trying to find their own space. But I would know that going into the organization first. And keep in mind, though, organizations have great intentions. They do. And organizations are truly trying to move the needle. And I've seen it happen a lot. But we also have to pay attention to the outcome, what people are actually experiencing in the process. Yes. And, you know, and I think we have time for one more question. And um, someone asked this, um, let's see here, Michelle, and I think this is a great topic to end on. And basically, you know, I've reported on artificial intelligence interviews. So, you know, you have to take games and everything. And the idea is that the great promise is that this makes the hiring process more equitable for everyone because, you know, it eliminates sort of that human part of the hiring process, even though you meet a recruiter eventually. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on AI interviews? And that's coming from Michelle. 
So a, a couple of things, and, and I have an opinion about this, as most <laughs> have an opinion about this. So uh, whenever I'm talking to recruiters, they're like, what do you think about AI? One of the things that I always mention is data in, data out. So like, so in order for the algorithm to work for artificial intelligence, the data going into this algorithm also has to be non-biased. But what tends to happen is you have real people who all have their own unconscious bias biases um, being input into this algorithm somehow. So again, even with great intent, we always want to measure the outcome. Does the data suggest that this, that this technology, this AI technology is actually helping? That's one. The second thing is um, I, I also am hopeful that organizations aren't using AI as a way to not become more comfortable with diversity in general. So, um, so by being able to say, oh, I'm just going to let the, um, this technology pull resumes into our organization. Okay, but don't forget that you still have recruiters. Can you make sure that they're also feeling cultural, I mean, co competent, capable, and comfortable when it comes to matters of diversity as well, too? So it, both pieces are important. I like, I like the idea of AI, but I'm also a major proponent of checking the data, checking the outcomes, even if the intent is positive. Yeah. And I know that I think it was Amazon had an issue several years ago where they were doing, you trying out AI. I don't know if it actually ever was part of the actual hiring process, but it ended up um, picking predominantly men, I believe. And even after trying to, to fix it, um, it just ended up that the bias had been introduced already because it was trained using existing applications, which was from overwhelmingly men. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where it, it, it can never actually replace the, the hiring process itself with humans. So, um, but Jen, thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, I hope everyone follows you on LinkedIn because I know you're, you're posting great stuff and I know you have events coming up and things like that. So I do. And I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned that if, um, if there's any organization or recruiters that are interested in learning more about implementing a, an effective recruiting, diversity recruiting program, I'm actually doing a free training on June the 16th. So um, thanks for reminding me of that. And they can just go to my page to, to see it under my features. <laughs> wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time and this wonderful conversation. I know I got a lot out of it and I'm sure our members did too. And to all of you out there, I hope that um, you enjoyed this discussion. I hope you got a lot out of it. And I hope you'll join us next week. We have these conversations every week, same time, same place. And as always, especially during this time, whether it's your mental health or physical health, I encourage you to take care of yourself. Um, make sure you're following the guidelines of local health officials and the World Health Organization. You can only be a good candidate and get hired if you're well enough to do so. Um, so please take care of yourself and we'll see you here next week. Thank you.